Gilleleje is a small fishing port not far from Espejärd on Denmark's northern coast of Zealand. More than 1,000 Jewish refugees pass through this port on their way to safety in Sweden. The train ride from Copenhagen to Gilleleje was filled with suspense. Most of the refugees did not know what to expect when they arrived at the ports. But in each case, until both passage was secured, lodging was found in private homes or in vacant summer cottages. Rescue was not without its dangers. On the evening of the 6th of October 1943, Pastor Hans Hiel Jensen assured 80 Jewish refugees safe hiding in the Gilleleje church attic. That night they were betrayed by a local resident and captured by the Gestapo. Most were then deported to the Theresienstadt concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. Pastor Jensen, emotionally broken by this betrayal, died soon after. Franz Thompson was 13 years old when his father, captain of a fishing boat based in the Snekkerstone port, involved him in the rescue effort. I understood that these were people who were being persecuted by the Germans and we had to get them to Sweden. If not, they would have been shot or sent to concentration camps. We learned from underground sources when there was risk of German patrols and then we had to remain in port. As soon as we got the all clear, we could go out, which we did two or three times a week. We had to be careful of German patrols, including their airplanes. Our boat was shot at once. On that trip, in addition to Jewish refugees, we had on board two resistance fighters. When the boat reached Sweden, the crew had to stay overnight for a carpenter to put wooden plugs into the bullet holes to hide evidence of the shots. The next morning the boat went north, away from the usual crossing lanes. The crew stopped the engine to let the boat drift. When a German patrol boat stopped to ask what they were doing, the crew said they had engine trouble and had been without power since the day before. The Germans then towed them to the Elsinore port and after they left, my father started the engine and returned the boat safely to Snekerston. Newspaper writer Borge Rönne was an organizer of the Elsinore Sewing Club, one of the many rescue groups based in the area. It was in many ways very difficult times, but something cleared up at that moment when the hunting of the Jewish people began. Then we know there was something to do. We met plenty of Jewish people at that time behind the coast. So we catch three trucks at a special point, which collected about 60 Jewish people of all kinds. We collected them and drove through the country up to the northern part of uh, Sealand, where we have heard there was a transport poss possibility to Sweden. Day after day, night after night, we collected the people at different places in Elsinore. People were very helpful to uh, hide the people until they should go. And uh, normally the boat was quite loaded, about 14, 16 people every night. Sometimes the, there were so many refugees that we have to sail twice a night. Well, of course, we were careful uh, that the Germans should not get to know about our things. But the, we couldn't have done it without a massive help by the people in Elsinore. Every, plenty of people did know about us. We know there were so-called stickers who would tell the Germans about it, but we uh, keep away from them, and we try not to have something with these people to do. But even the uh, 
telephonist girls called us the night and told us what happened, that we should be aware of that and not uh, go into con conflict with the Germans. The, it was not only us uh, who made the transport. There were people who, who brought refugees uh, across the sea with, uh, with kayaks, with one man boat or two man boats. Um, there were plenty of organizations in that time who did something to help the people. It was naturally to, to help the people. Uh, I was caught one, uh, once of the German be, um, besides 12 fishermen from Snekerstein to, we were brought to the Gestapo headquarters in Copenhagen and put to prison, but they kept us just uh, eight days. They have no evidence what we have done and uh, they couldn't keep us. And then we continued. It, it's not heroic in what we did. We, we just did what was right. Herbert Pundik, recently retired editor of Politiken, the leading Danish newspaper, has not forgotten the crisis and the response of his fellow Danes. This was the situation as we approached the fateful uh, night, you know, uh, between the uh, 1st and 2nd of October 1943, when the Germans got at us. And at that time, you know, nothing was prepared. We were, of course, we were, of course, afraid of what might happen, but we took no measures, not individually and not collectively as a community, to protect ourselves. And the fact that we were saved is not due to our own precautions. It was only due to the, to the uh, fantastic, I think, uh, um, uh, Danish sense uh, of, on one hand, decency, on the other hand, power of improvisation. If you want to understand the whole question of the rescue, you have to go down to the, the details of individual, individual suddenly, suddenly acting. And I think this is, uh, this is a major uh, lesson of the whole rescue business in Denmark, that individual count. If you want to become active, you can make a major contribution uh, to the life and uh, the destiny of other, of other people, of other individuals. And that is exactly what the, the, the Danes did here. The, these people, the individuals, saved other individuals' lives, thereby uh, the totality was that out of uh, 7,000 Jews, uh, only, only 474 were, were apprehended and caught caught by the Germans. By late 1943, it was clear that Germany would be defeated. Allied planes devastated German cities with unrelenting day and night time bombings. The German army had been defeated in North Africa. The Allies had invaded Italy. And German troops were turned back in Russia. Just to the east of Sweden, Finland reflected a different situation. Although today Helsinki, its capital, has only a small Jewish community, in 1943, Finland's total Jewish population numbered nearly 2,000. They included descendants of Russian Jewish soldiers who retired in the Russian canton of Finland during the mid and late 1800s. They were, in addition, pre-war European Jewish immigrants. As a result of its 1939 winter war with the Soviet Union, Finland lost its Karelian Peninsula. In 1941, Hitler offered Finland an opportunity to regain this territory by participating in the German attack against the Soviet Union. In 1943, the Finnish army was still deeply involved as a co-belligerent with Germany in this continuing military campaign. 
One of the great ironies of the war found German soldiers allied at this time with 300 Jewish enlisted men and officers in the Finnish army. Some of whom appear at their filled synagogue just behind the front lines. Looking out over one of the busiest intersections in Helsinki today is the statue of Marshal Mannerheim, a tribute to his military service and his leadership as president of Finland. His visit to Helsinki synagogue in 1944 publicly recognized and honored the patriotism of Finland's Jewish community. A memorial wreath presented in tribute to the Jewish soldiers who fought and died in its two wars against the Soviets was symbolic assurance to the Jewish community of the government's commitment to its continuing safety. Ambassador Max Jakobson remembers the difficult situation which Finland and its Jewish community say, faced. Of course, uh, uh, there was reason to fear in general terms, uh, that the war would end badly for Finland, uh, uh, and that that would uh, uh, be bad for the Jews, that would lead to uh, uh, serious consequences for the Jewish community here. Uh, but this was not a, um, a fear, uh, particularly for the Jews. I mean, this uh, fear was something uh, that of, of something that would be a heavy blow to the whole Finnish nation if, if it had happened. I'm now talking about uh, Jews who have Finnish citizens. For the refugees, there was, of course, an additional fear. The fear that, um, for one reason or another, uh, the Finnish authorities would not um, uh, maintain uh, their respect for their uh, asylum, for their status as, as uh, political refugees in Finland. Uh, their position, of course, was insecure, it was uncertain, uh, as is the position of refugees everywhere. The position of the Jewish community in Finland, the community of, of Jews who were citizens of Finland, was never uh, at issue. Uh, there was no uh, uh, policy on the part of, of the Finnish government to uh, apply any kind of discrimination to this community. And no. indeed, indeed, in Finnish citizens like myself, um, fought in the war as, uh, of course, every other, all other Finnish uh, citizens. Uh, the Germans uh, demanded uh, uh, that uh, refugees from Austria and Germany should be returned to Germany on the grounds, uh, fictitious grounds, uh, that uh, these people had committed crimes uh, and therefore uh, had to be handed back. Uh, a small number of these were actually handed back without, at that time, without the knowledge of the government. It was a deal between the uh, police authorities of the two countries. Uh, the demand that all of them should be handed over was rejected by the Finnish government. Uh, we must remember also that this was at the time when, uh, when Germany was at, its height, the, at the height of its power in, in Europe. Uh, Germany at the time dominated the whole continent of Europe. Finland was uh, isolated. Uh, Finland was heavily dependent on German supplies of food and so on. So that uh, the temptation to uh, appease the Germany was of course there. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore it was important that uh, at the time the government did reject that demand and by doing that uh, uh, defended or maintained uh, Finland's uh, status as a uh, democratic country and, uh, and a country which respected international law.